Welcome. Hello, good morning, Campus Party 2013. Welcome back to the Galileo stage. Today, we're, this is our final day at Campus Party on the Galileo stage, and today we're joined by Mr. Paul McKnight, who'll be giving us a talk on Vex Robotics. Please round of applause for Paul. Morning. Uh, I'm Paul McKnight. For just three years now, I've been uh, the head of Vex Robotics in Europe. Uh, and as well as that, I've also been a STEM ambassador. Uh, I'm responsible for the growth of the VEX platform in, uh, in schools in the UK and across Europe. And also, um, like I say, I go into schools, I'll uh, work with students or with robotics uh, in the classroom in extracurricular activities. And I've also been involved in the development of the design and technology curriculum in the UK and the, the path forward that that is going to take. Now, over the next 40, 45 minutes, I'm going to speak to you about uh, VEX Robotics. I'm going to speak to you about robotics in general. Uh, I'm going to link that into competitive robotics and the importance of competitive robotics when we look at careers and, and moving forward in life. So we'll start with, there we go, we'll start with what is robotics. Now depending on who you ask you will get a different answer uh, depending on whether you ask a, a child, someone who's in the teens, someone who's uh, in, in industry. So we'll look at some examples. Um, now the most common form of robotics, if you ask someone what is a robot, what is robotics, you'll get people talking about things that we'll see on screen here, uh, robots from movies. So we've got Johnny 5, C-3PO, R2-D2, Optimus Prime, and then the T-800 from Terminator films. Now, when people ask what is robotics, this is what people will, will relate to, but ultimately these aren't real. They don't exist. They exist in the world of film, but not in reality. Um, although some of these are getting closer to reality with the advances that, uh, that companies are making, particularly with military. So, for this first element, this is the, the riskiest part of the, uh, the presentation, we're going to do some demos. Uh, and first of all, we've got the, uh, the AR drone, which is going to be hopefully uh, lifting to the air. My colleague Chris is, is, uh, is manning that. So this operates, uh, it's a gyrocopter, many of you may have seen it. It has a number of gyros in it. It also has an ultrasonic rangefinder underneath, so it can uh, work out how far it is off the ground. So, and there's a, a certain amount of autonomy within this drone, but it's been, uh, it's been flown by an iPhone or uh, Android phone. So there's elements of human interaction, but there's also sensors as well. So before, before anything goes badly wrong with that, I think we'll, we'll land that one. The next robot I was going to demonstrate was a Hexbug Spider XL. Unfortunately, UPS didn't want me to show this because on the way down, they managed to destroy uh, the packaging and damage it. So unfortunately, it's not here. But I don't know, has anyone heard of Hexbugs? No, they are a, a micro, yeah, there's some sort of, there. there's a micro robotic creature. There's various different ranges. Uh, they all involve some form of sensor or human interaction. Um, so that would have been walking around the stage. So if you just imagine that. Um, and then the last robot we're going to demonstrate, just uh, while we're looking at sort of the consumer side of robotics, is a RoboNova, uh, which again, some of you may have seen. This is one of the humanoid robots. Um, and this has a range of different servos in it and mechanical um, elements. And Chris is demonstrating some of the pre-programmed actions that, that this humanoid robot can complete. So it can stand on one leg. It can do various different moves, such as forward rolls, handstands. We'll see how this gets on. There we go, there we go, typical. Even the robots get stage fright. So I think, are we going to see a headstand? Or a forward roll? Yeah. So uh, both of the, the robots we've seen here have some degree of, of people would say that's a robot. There's another area of robotics as well which is absolutely huge and this is industry. So what we can see there is a, a robot arm that's moving and manipulating uh, materials from one production line or packaging line to another. We've then got robots and robot arms that are used in the, uh, the automotive industry on automated production lines. There's another image there of uh, some robot arms. And then there's a, a robot that's doing some cutting and welding. And one of the things that's common with all these robots is they are performing tasks that historically would have been performed by humans, but robots do them because they can do them consistently, consistently more accurately. Uh, they don't complain as much as human workers will. So there's a, there's a lot of socio um, and sort of uh, moral questions about ro robots using, using industry, but they are massive and it's increasing. So 
that brings us to say, what is a robot? Now, there's no general consensus on what is a robot. It's a very broad term. Um, but one of the, some of the things that are agreed is robots move around. We've seen that with both of the robots here. They, they move around, they will do something. They will operate a mechanical limb. Now, that was true for the RoboNova. It wasn't the case for the AR drone. So does that mean that's not a robot? They can sense and manipulate their environment. Now, that flips it. The RoboNova had no sensors. It was responding to human input. It was responding to pre-programmed input. The AI drone was using sensors to respond to its environment. So in some ways, both are robots. In some ways, both aren't. But one of the other things is they exhibit intelligent behavior. Um, and that might be pre-programmed. It might be sensed. But that's something that all robots will do. So can we define what is a robot? Again, there's no great consensus. This first quote is from a gentleman called Joseph Engelberger. He was uh, seen by many as the father of robotics. He was one of the first to bring industrial robotics uh, into sort of mainstream factories. And he said, I can't define a robot, but I know when I see one. And I think everyone will agree that. Everyone will say, yes, I think that's a robot, that's not. So we'll have a quick show of hands. The AR drone. Do you, if you think that's a robot, just put your hand up. So there's a few people there. Now, the RoboNova. Again, if you think that's a robot, put your hands up. Yeah, a lot more people there, which is interesting because, as we said, the RoboNova had no sensors. It had no interaction, really, with its, its environment other than the human control. So we'll look at another definition from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Any automatically operated machine that replaces human effort, though it may not resemble human beings in appearance or perform functions in a human-like manner. Now, when we think about the, the images of the industrial robots that we just saw, this, this quote links very closely to that, less so with these uh, sort of consumer-based robots. But does that mean they're not robots because they don't, uh, particularly the AR drone, because it doesn't resemble a human? Well, I, I would argue not. Other people will argue differently. This last definition from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says a machine, uh, it defines a robot as a machine that looks like a human being and performs a various complex acts, such as walking or talking of a human being. Now, this is quite a focused uh, definition, but it, the, the, the dictionary also goes, goes on to say, or a device that automatically performs complicated, often repetitive tasks. So that broadens the scope of what this may, may define. And it finishes with a mechanism guided by automatic controls. So between the three of them, you could say, these three quotes, you could say these two do, by definition, are, they, they are robots. I think one of the problems with trying to define a robot is it's such a broad area that you have to focus in and look at, at if you're going to define it in one, one sentence, you have to look at one area. So industrial robotics, it's much easier to describe and define an industrial robot than it is for robotics in general. Um, I mean, for my opinion, I would define a robot as a mixture of mechanisms that may be structural, a mixture of electronics that when combined together and when programmed with either sensors or human input, result in an action or perform a task. That's about as generic as you could get. It covers everything that you see in these two. But again, different people will have different opinions. The next area uh, that we'll look at for robots and what defines a robot, what is a robot, is robotic kits. Now, this is where I'll start talking a little bit about VEX. It won't be totally focused on VEX. Um, but this is a robotic kit. Now, you can see there uh, the, the range of parts in one of the kits. What is, is that VEX? No, VEX is, is more than just the parts. VEX, the VEX robotics design system includes and encompasses the curriculum that's developed that uses these parts. It includes the competition that's de been developed around these parts and that people will use the parts for. And it also involves the links to industry. So for example, the programming languages we used are, are C-based. They're, they're used widely. They're, they're not bespoke to VEX. They're used in, in industry. There's also the link with uh, CAD software. I don't know whether anyone's heard of Autodesk. It's a, a global uh, engineering software company. One of their programs is used. All the parts are modeled in, in uh, Autodesk Inventor so students can digitally design and prototype the robots on screen. So it's that link to industry when using VEX that really, really is one of the big important factors. So we've got the parts. They're central, they're core to all things involved with VEX, but it is more than just the parts. We can see we've got some, some metal parts, we've got gears, we've got motors, we've got claws, we've got a range of different sensors there, we've got a joystick, um, we've got some uh, motor encoders, some omni wheels, there's a, a number of different parts. Individually, those parts are not a robot. You know, take a piece of metal, it's not a robot. Any single one of them parts, it's not. 
by definition, a robot. It's only when you combine the parts, when you bring them together to form something, to program them, and then get an output that we would say, by definition, it is a robot. And what we'll do now is we'll just demonstrate one of the, the very basic VEX robots. This is the, the VEX Clawbot. It's the only robot we give instructions to build. Um, Chris again is going to hopefully demonstrate it, picking up a, a bottle of water. So the thing with VEX is it's more than just assembly. It's about open-ended design challenges. So whether it be the curriculum or the competition, students are given the kit of parts and then they have to come up with the solutions themselves. So it's, um, it might be designing a robot to pick up a bottle of water. It might be navigating through a maze. It may be a competition robot. Success. Um, that's what VEX is about. VEX is not the only uh, robotic kit that's out there from late 90s. Uh, Lego has been used extensively in the classroom. Again, many of you may be aware of the, the Mindstorms. It's in its third incarnation now. EV3 has just launched. And what Lego uh, and the Mindstorms platform does, it takes the, the construction toy that everyone knows from childhood, adds electronics to it, and then it becomes a control system. Um, what VEX does is very similar. It takes it takes a kit of parts and, and sensors, but it goes beyond that. So you've got a joystick. You can, you can physically drive the robot around, and it's that combination of human interaction as well as programming that really sort of steps VEX apart from, from other platforms. So that's VEX as a platform. We'll now look at competition, and we'll start moving, moving uh, what I'm going to talk about into competition, and then, and then beyond that, how that is important in, in a career. So there's lots of different robotic competitions out there. There's a lot of uh, open platforms, so people may have been involved in uh, sumo competitions, in line tracking, uh, underwater challenges. There's a lot of different competitions out there. As, again, a quick show of hands. Has anyone here been involved in, in robotics competitions before? Just the one person that I would expect to say yes, because they've, they've been involved with VEX and, uh, and FIRST Robotics. Um, there's also a number of closed platforms, and that ultimately is what VEX is. Uh, the VEX Robotics Competition is a platform that uses the, the VEX products. Uh, it, it goes from a young age, so we have the VEX IQ Challenge, which starts at primary age. The VEX Robotics Competition takes things forward from there and, and uses the platform through secondary school uh, and into uh, colleges. And then it finishes with VEX U, which is a university level competition. And this is where VEX sort of opens up a little and it allows uh, teams to use other microcontrollers, other sensors. You can uh, fabricate and 3D print your own parts for robots in, in the VEX U competition. But all of them uh, have the same, the same ultimate aim, which is uh, it's a true engineering challenge. There's a problem that needs to be solved and, and you design a robot to solve that. There are other competitions out there. There's Best Robotics, there's Bot Ball, and then there's the first family, uh, first Lego lead, first tech challenge, first robotics competition. All of these are a competition that take a platform or a set of materials and, and give, give uh, design-led challenges for that competition. Now, I'm going to show a short video in a second which looks at the VEX Robotics competition. It's, it was filmed at this year's World Championships. Or, yeah, this year's World Championships. Um, and it'll give you a flavour and an idea of what robotics competition is about. We're here at the VEX Robotics Competition World Championship with over 24 countries, 700 teams, 15,000 students competing in a middle school, high school, college, and elementary school world championships. It's overwhelming being here. There are thousands of kids and they all want to talk to you about their robots and where they're from and what it took to get their team to put their robot together and compete today. Well, the competition has been something else. Uh, the excitement, the uh, focus of the kids, the uh, fact that uh, you know, collaboration is part of this competition. So it isn't all about you know, winning and, and holding your innovations to yourself, but being able to share that and being able to bring that together with others. These kids are learning project management, time management, stress management. They're learning how to brainstorm, how to work together, and that's what students need to know after high school. NASA is a big supporter of the VEX Robotics program, just as we do with several other robotics competition programs, primarily because we believe in the fundamental message and ethos of these programs to get kids excited about science, technology, and engineering. Autodesk has been involved for several years, and you know, for me, it's actually the first year attending VEX. Uh, and I have to say, it's really exceeded my expectations. The energy level with the contestants is really, really high. 
And I would say the level of competition I see is amazing. It's really, really inspiring, especially at some of the young ages that you see these students. We're very excited about the new VEX IQ platform for this exact reason. You see these young children who are in fourth grade and are very curious about how the different components work. And it's not about building a big robot. It's just about well, how does this motor really drive the wheel? How does these gears really come together? And just, again, exploration and, and curiosity. So STEM technology is core to our value. We know that uh, we're going to need innovators and, and scientists in the future. And we've really been uh, focused on how do we build this pipeline and how do we get that started back in an early age. I've always been interested in robotics, and I wanted to apply neuroscience to VEX, the VEX platform. And um, I wanted to create a way that could help um, people with disabilities or who have lost limbs and need prosthetics so that they can be more independent in society. We need kids to think differently. We need problem solvers, creators, innovators. And that doesn't happen by chance. That is by design. We're creating not just scientists and engineers, but we're creating just capable, qualified, competent students for what they do after this competition. You get people of all ages and backgrounds coming together to really uh, collaborate and figure out how they can use technology to improve the life and improve uh, the systems around us. And I think it, it gets spurs the interest into this area and creates uh, much more awareness and possibility. Now, hopefully, you know, unlock some great scientists and, and great inventors of the future right here and now. So, just picking up on a few of the points from that video, one of the things you'll have noticed is the age of the people involved. They start very young. There were students as young as, as seven years old there that are involved in the, the IQ platform. It goes all the way through education, right through to university level. And then the sexes of those involved, it's not a male-dominated area. It's, very, uh, it's a very open and accessible platform to females, and there's a lot of females involved in the program. One of the other things is the industry uh, that are involved. You saw some of the sponsors at the end, some of the people who were speaking. People from Autodesk, people from EMC, from NASA, from uh, Northrop Grumman. These are organizations that recognize the benefits that involvement in a robotics competition provides for people who are about to start a career. And just the, the guy from NASA, Dave Lavery, who was talking, his, his title there was Program Executive, but he's Program Executive of Deep Space Exploration. So he's basically responsible for everything that goes outside of, of, uh, of you know, sort of the Earth's um, sort of sphere of influence. So anything that goes in, into deep space, any probes, any rovers, the Mars rover, Curiosity, that was part of his program. And NASA sees a great um, importance in robotics competitions because basically any space probe, any, any uh, planetary lander is a robot. That's what it, it has to respond, it has to look after itself, it has to, be, to take the programming that's been put in there and respond to the sensor input. So, you know, these organizations see the massive importance in, in competitive robotics and what it can give people as a career. So, beyond just those few things that I mentioned, then why is competitive robotics a good, a good thing to be involved with, a good step for a career? Now, this, the, these points aren't true for every single platform, they are true for a lot of them. Brainstorming ideas, there's no one solution that's given. You, you get a problem, the competition, you have to go and solve it. You have to come up with different ideas and different ways of, of solving that. You then need to come up with designs for the robot. So you've got the solution, this is what we want to do. You've got to design it within the constraints of the parts that you've got. You may come up with a great idea, but it's not physically possible with the parts. So you need to come up with these different designs. You need to then look at the different subsystems. So you'll have a, you know, the, the mechanical, the drivetrain, the, the lift mechanism, the, the manipulator. These all need to be designed independently to perform the tasks that you've set out uh, in, the, in the brainstorming design sessions. They then need to be integrated together because you have all these different subsystems, but they need to work together. So the structural mechanical systems need to work with the sensors. It needs to be powered correctly. All these things need to come together. You then need to consider the implications of the design choices you've made. You may want to do a certain thing, but then by doing that, it foregoes the ability to do something else. So there's a lot of, of trade-offs that are there that when you're going through the process of designing. The robot then needs to be programmed. The sensors that have been put on there, it needs to operate autonomously. So that's another area that you need to look at in, in depth. And then evaluating that finished robot. Does it meet the, uh, 
the, the ideas that you came up with at the start? Does, does the finished robot meet and, and perform those as you expected them to? And the final part, part, and one of the most important, is the testing process and going through, and what we, as there's a lot of talk of it within VEX, both curriculum and competition, about iteration, going through different iterations of design. So you'll come up with a robot, you'll then test it, you'll then see some aspects won't work, so you'll change the design, you'll test it again. And these different iterations are a massive, massive factor and a massive, massive importance. Mm -hmm. And it's something that industry looks for. These are skills that employers will look for, and they're not skills that are taught in every, uh, every lesson. They're, they're not really taught in any lessons, they're taught with, uh, in things like competition, robotics and, 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 and other platforms. So is this even important? Why, why are we talking about this? Well, it's massively important. Um, this obviously relates to the UK, but it's a, it's a problem that's been uh, seen all across, uh, all across Europe and, and America, that there's a massive need for graduates uh, who are coming through STEM, uh, STEM, career, STEM uh, education, whether it be engineering, whether it be technology, or science related and there's not enough people coming through. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is perception. A recent piece of research from Engineering UK said that nearly half of, of seven to 11 year olds thought a career in engineering would be boring. Now, why is that? Do they not, do they not understand, and this is probably the case, do they not understand what engineering is? I mean, just for example, there's uh, someone I went to school with there, a sound, a sound engineer, audio engineer, and almost every week on Facebook, I see them tagging themselves at venues like the O2, uh, at venues like the NEC in Birmingham, at stadiums, he works behind the sound desk at a concert and he's an audio engineer. Now, what isn't great about that? You know, that's, that's an exciting career to be going to all these, these different places. Kids of, of a young age aren't realising this. And, and one of the things that VEX can do and competitions can do is engage students. So they, they think robotics is cool. You see robots like this, you think this is cool. If you can take that into the classroom, that's, that's fantastic. It engages them in the classroom. They're learning subjects that will be useful for them when they move forward in a career. But then when you take it to competitive robotics, that's the next step. It, it continues that engagement and it gives them all the softer skills, the transferable skills, which we'll touch on on the next slide, that employers actually look for. And in the short time that VEX has been in the UK, we've seen students who have decided on a career in engineering because of involvement with VEX. We've seen uh, students, both male and female, who weren't looking for a career in engineering, weren't when they were choosing their options, when they were looking at what exams they were going to take, and they weren't thinking about, about engineering and programming. They are now because of involvement with VEX, so it can really change the complete way that people will look at their outlook on a career. So the transferable skills, some of them were touched on in the video. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but these are all real key skills that they're not academic skills they're transferable skills that employers look for and the employers that were in the video employers such as national grid they've are now the national sponsor for the uk Com vex robotics competition they see that what vex does what robotics competitions do is give students the next generation of of, uh, of staff that these organizations are looking for they give them the skills that they need so We've talked, I've talked about robotics. I've talked about the transition to robotics competition and the importance of that. I'm now gonna look at a, a few other um, tell you, subtle secrets to success, but some other areas that are important uh, to consider when, when looking at a future career. So for this part, um, I'd like to say thank you to a colleague in, in the US, in Canada who did a recent talk and he, a lot of this was drawn from some of the, the things he was talking about. So the question, what does it take to be successful? Now, in many ways, that is, it's a rhetorical question. There's a lot of factors involved in what will, what will make someone successful in a certain field or in a certain career. So we'll start with a quote from um, a early 19th century US uh, writer and poet who said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. So what does that mean? Well, if you're not enthusiastic about something, if you're not passionate about it, then you will never achieve success. If you want to be excellent in any given field, you have to be enthusiastic about it. You have to want to do it. And a lot of people, they're, they're faced with a lot of choices when they go through life, uh, particularly when they're leaving school, when they're looking at careers. And a lot of people are drawn to the lucrative options, the, the easier option, they'll, they'll go down that path rather than maybe the, the, their actual true passion. They'll choose the easy option. And the question is which, which one of those is right, which one of those is the most successful? So we'll take a look. There's two people. We've got the guy who listened to parents, he listened to some of his friends and he went with a, the safe option, he went with the lucrative option. He wanted to be an accountant, so he, he was... He was coerced into being an accountant. He was good with numbers, that's the job for you. He goes to work, he does what he does, it gets to five o'clock, 
He leaves the office, he finishes, he forgets about work, that's him done. He works nine to five, it's just a job, it pays the bills, that's all it is. And then there's the other guy, Mr. Enthusiasm. He loves accounting, that's what he lives for. He's always wanted to be an accountant. Every single day he's doing accountancy things, he's writing down numbers, he's using calculators, do, doing what accountants do. He absolutely loves what he does. When he goes home, he's researching new uh, new, new ideas, new ways that, of, of accounting that he can bring into work. He finishes at five o'clock, he might stay late some nights, not because he has to, but because he wants to, because he loves it, he's got that passion. So ask yourselves again, which one of these two is going to be the most successful? The answer is Mr. Enthusiasm. Don't be held hostage when thinking about what you want to do as a career by other people's perceptions or ideas of what you should be doing. You have to follow your passion, you have to do what you want to do. If you, in most cases, if you're in the top 1% of a career, uh, of, a, of an area, um, even in a non-lucrative field, you'll be more successful than if you're in aver average in a, a more lucrative field. Um, no, no one will achieve greatness without enthusiasm. That's one of the key points to take from this. So, the next section, how to compete. Again, there's two ways to compete. There's rising above, there's be focused and aiming high and achieving what you achieve because you are better than, better than everyone. That's one way of competing. The second way is rising to the top by pulling everyone else down, by not necessarily by excelling, but by bringing everyone else down and pulling yourself up. So which, which one of those is the right way, which is the wrong way? Again, people will have different opinions, different ideas. But it's this negative view of competition, the pulling people down, that means competition isn't... It's, it's, it's viewed negatively, particularly in education, particularly in schools. Now, a lot of schools don't look at competition. They take competition out of it because it's not important. It couldn't be more important. Everyone competes. Competition is a skill. When you leave, uh, when you leave education, when you're looking at university places, people are competing for those places. When you move into a career, people are competing for those jobs. So being good at competition, knowing how to compete, and competing in the right way is massively, massively important. And it's a massive key skill that a lot of people don't realize is, is a skill It's important. It's up there with teamwork, it's up there with time management, project management, any of those transferable skills. Competition is absolutely key. And as well as the two ways to compete, there's two types of people and that usually determines how they compete. So at school, a lot of people, you'll, there'll be that one person who was sort of at the top of the class who achieved the great grades and people will look at them and think one of two things. They'll think, that's fantastic. I want to be like them. I want to, I want to achieve what they've achieved. Or they'll be the person that looks at them and go, Bleh. you know, they've probably got no friends. They probably don't go out. You know, I, I couldn't care less. There's two definite ways of looking at that and that will lead to the way people will compete, whether they'll rise above or whether they'll drag people down. And how they do it, that's the important way. You look at competing, you look at being, being the best, you have to look at the people that are the best and say, right, well, I want to learn how they are the best. You work with them, find out what they do, what they do to achieve what they do, and then aim to be the best and better them and do it in the right way. So this last section, is, uh, it starts with a quote from a, a football coach. He said, perfectionism is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. People often have, set, have false limits that are set by other people, so they'll, they'll limit themselves based on what people think is you know, what they can achieve. You should never do that. You should always aim for perfection. Now, the important thing is not being blinded and realizing Perfection is not attainable. There's no such thing as perfection. There's a lot of quotes by a lot of different people who talk about perfection and, uh, and the fact that it's not attainable. But if you chase perfection, if you strive for perfection, then on the way, you will achieve greatness. You will catch excellence. So it's important that you focus on being the best and then in doing that, you will get, you will get excellence along the way. There's a lot of fears. I like limits. They're an illusion. People put these in place for you. Ignore them. Aim for the top. Always go for that. You may not get there, but in the way, on the way, you will catch excellence. So, the last three slides, we've talked about a number of different things, which is maybe a little bit of a departure from where it started, talking about robotics and then into competition robotics. So, pulling that together, what, what, what's the link? What was the point? Well, people who are involved in competitive robotics are involved 
because they want to be involved. They're not forced into doing it. Every robotics competition is, is, you know, it's optional. You don't have to do it. You do it because you want to. People are passionate. People will spend hours and hours de uh, developing the robot because they want to, because they've got enthusiasm about it, because they're passionate. And because they've got enthusiasm, they will be successful. How to compete. Vex, the ethos of Vex and the ethos of a lot of, of robotic competitions first is another one. It's, it's not about winning at all costs. It's about winning in the right way. It's a collaborative approach. It's, it's about doing it in the right way. And again, don't pull people down. Strive for the excellence by competing in the right way. And then perfection. How does that link? Well, we talked about Vex and, and the, the whole process of competition being an iterative process. And that's striving for, for perfection. Aim, it, aim for the best robot. You won't get there the first time, but that doesn't mean you failed. That means you take the design you've got, you adjust it, you amend it, you try again, you test. Iteration, constant evolution, aiming, to, for, aiming for perfection, but catching greatness on the way. And all of this is done in a backdrop of reality. It's not theoretical. It's not done on paper. It's done with real products in real competitions. And it's, it's a very visceral experience. And that's one of the great things about Vex, it's hands-on, it's learning by doing. And that brings me to this last quote from US President, or ex-US President, Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I'll forget. Teach me and I'll remember. Involve me and I'll learn. And if, through involvement in, in competitions and competitive robotics, if that leads to learning, then the aims and objectives of, of Vex as a platform and of other competitions as, as, as events has been met because people have learnt and they will move forward and, and move forward in life and in career. So we have a workshop later on in workshop one, which is out in the, uh, the live area. We'll be splitting the workshop into two sections. There's an element on programming where we'll have some pre-built robots that people can program through a, a design challenge through a field. We'll then have a mechatronic section where everyone will be given a robot base chassis and we'll be designing and creating uh, parts to go on to that. So anyone is welcome to come along to that later on. I want to thank you very much for coming out early because I know it's, uh, it's, it was an early morning start and it's the, the last day so there's a lot, of, a lot of tired eyes out there. But I appreciate you coming, listening to what I had to say. I hope in some way you found it useful. And if there's any questions, uh, I think the guys are going to be walking around to, to see. So thank you very much. So it's a Any questions, guys? Yeah. Nope. Well, it's right, well, if any of you want to have a look at any of the robots we've had, the, the AI drone, the VEX robot, the Robin over, then feel free to come down um, you know, once you've finished. And again, the workshop will have them there as well. So thank you very much. Round of applause, please, for Paul. Next up, we'll have Van Gogh's Pertinence will be giving us a talk on kinetic energy and the future, how kinetic energy will be used. Thank you very much. That'll be at 11 o'clock.